Today's class is about a comparison of the Federal Rules of Evidence against the California Evidence Code. In many, many places, the rules are quite similar. And in those places where the rules are so similar that there is no significant difference between them, I have marked them with a red asterisk which means there's no significant difference between them. I've organized the material regarding uh, the law of evidence in a way that I think it will be easier for you to remember uh, the, the difference between the rules. I've organized it according to the way that you would sort of naturally think about the law of evidence as opposed to just a bunch of rule numbers. And you'll see that here on the board. The material on the board is organized first into relevance. You certainly, in thinking of the law of evidence, would think, is the evidence relevant or not? And we'd want to know that California versus the FRE rules on evidence relevance. Secondly, there are some rules which are designed to prevent the misuse of relevant evidence. We see Federal Rules 403 and California 352, which is the equivalent of that. And there's a red asterisk here to indicate there's no significant difference between those two rules. Third, the category that we have this we'll discuss is public policy exclusions. You would certainly think of those as a category, so you would like to be aware of the differences between the public policy exclusions under the federal rules versus the public policy exclusions under the California Evidence Code. Next, there uh, is uh, basically hearsay, but you should think of hearsay as really a device intended to assure the reliability of out-of-court statements. Statements which are made out of court do not have the same degree of reliability as people testifying at trial. You can see their demeanor. You can uh, uh, cross-examine them. And so statements which are made out of court are naturally not as reliable. And there are a bunch of rules, namely the hearsay rules, which are, decide which are aimed at selecting which of the out-of-court statements will be admissible, which are reliable enough to be admissible. So we've looked at a bunch of the hearsay exceptions and compared the federal rules and the California rules. Next, after reliability of the out-of-court statements, comes the reliability of documents. And of course, we rely, we, uh, documents need to be authenticated. That's our first step in reliability of documents. And we'll look at the federal rules of evidence regarding authentication versus the California rules regarding authentication. Next comes some substitutes uh, for evidence. Now, uh, uh, people may disagree about what to call these, but I'm speaking of such things as judicial notice, presumptions, that sort of thing, which is not, re not real kind of a substitute for evidence. And I don't have a better name for it, but we will compare the federal rules and the California rules regarding those kinds of evidence substitutes. And finally comes the question of who can testify. And as you can see here, I'll just cover this issue right now, uh, who can testify under the FRE 605, the judge is simply not competent to testify at the trial over which she or he is uh, judging. Uh, whereas, and you, you don't even have to object, the judge simply is not competent. Whereas under the California rules, CA, under the California rules, you must object in order to exclude the judge from uh, testifying. Now, uh, so we're going to start by going right through each of these conceptual categories and looking at uh, a comparison of the federal rules of evidence and the California rules in each of these, uh, these conceptual categories. We begin uh, with uh, uh, see, uh, with relevance, 
And evidence can be relevant, as you know, to prove some substantive fact, some fact of consequence having to do with the merits of the trial. And evidence can also be relevant to impeach. The rules for when the evidence is relevant on a substantive fact are essentially the same federal rules and California rules. The rules for impeaching are the same in many areas, but different in some. And I will point out those differences. First of all, uh, you recall that to impeach a prior inconsistent statement is a basis for impeaching. And in Calif in, uh, under the federal rules of evidence, a prior inconsistent statement may be admitted to impeach, uh, but not for its substantive value, unless that prior inconsistent statement was also made at a trial or hearing. But uh, unless you have some other exception of that sort, the prior inconsistent statement is admissible to impeach under the federal rules, but not for its substantive value. In California, we have a special hearsay exception under which this is admissible for its substantive value also. You might also look at, uh, also, uh, in addition to this section that I have cited here, section 1235 of the California Evidence Code, you might also look at section 769 and section 770, 769 and 770. I need to mention to you that throughout this presentation, in order to put this on the board, it is highly abbreviated. And I expect that your notes, I'm trying to go through this sl slowly so that you can expand on these uh, comments and add them into your notes. Uh, so again, back here, evidence relevant to impeach, prior inconsistent statements under the federal rules to impeach only, California at 1235 and also at uh, 769 and 770, you might add those to your notes. It shows that this evidence is admissible for its substantive value in California. The, you can impeach by reput poor reputation for truthfulness, bias, lack of competence, and you see the red asterisks on all of those. Also, prior convictions. Uh, prior convictions, as you know, are admissible to, uh, to impeach a person who is testifying. But uh, the, uh, in, the, in California, what's different about them is that on cross-examination, ordinarily, you can ask a person about prior, uh, uh, it's not just prior convictions, it's actually prior acts, uh, but convictions also these, these uh, uh, at 609, prior convictions under the California Code uh, are, can be used to impeach in civil cases, but not in criminal cases. Sorry, so let me get back to what I was saying here. I got this mixed up with a different section there for a moment. The prior convictions are admissible in civil and criminal cases in, uh, under the federal rules. And under the California rules, these are admissible in civil cases. But I'm a little concerned about that. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, this is 609. This is not admissible in civil cases uh, to prior convictions to impeach in civil cases. Uh, okay. Uh, so that takes care of relevant evidence and the places. Here is the key place where you would find a difference. And um, uh, I'm going to come back to this at the end of the lecture because I'm a little concerned that uh, 
the rule I gave you, I need to be absolutely sure that that's correct, that this is not admissible in civil cases but is in criminal cases. And so let's mark this and just mark it as something that I need to come back to uh, because I don't want to give out any incorrect information. So we're coming back to that one. So let's continue. Next, evidence to prevent, pardon me, rules to prevent the misuse of relevant evidence. And in particular, we're talking about character evidence and evidence which is substantially more prejudicial than probative. Character evidence under the federal rules is found at 404, and we have a red asterisk here saying that the California rule is essentially the same. And the same here, evidence which is substantially more prejudicial than probative, not being admissible, say 403 under the, Calif under the federal rules, 352 under the California rules, and those are essentially the same. Now that gets us then next to the public policy considerations. Over here on this board, we've talked about relevance, and we've talked about 352 and 403, and we're now moving to item three, the public policy exclusions. So let's take a look at some of those. The, uh, sorry, they're on this other board here. The public policy exclusions uh, here, we begin with subsequent remedial measures. Subsequent remedial measures are covered in FRE 407. As you know, they are not admissible to show negligence. However, California has a, a variation on that, saying if what you're trying to prove is strict liability as opposed to negligence, subsequent remedial measures are admissible to show that the product was defective in strict liability cases. So that's an important difference. Next comes settlement offers, uh, offers to settle or compromise. As you know, these are covered at FRE 408, which basically says that statements made during settlement offers are not admissible. And the California rule at 1115 and 1128 basically say the same thing, that uh, evidence made at settlement offers are not admissible. However, California specifically includes uh, mediation discussions. So if you're entering into mediation with someone regarding a dispute, everything, the documents, the preparation documents, the things which are said at the mediation settlement or mediation discussions, all of that material is excluded. All mediation material is excluded under these California rules. Next, still looking at public policy exclusions come the privileges. Uh, the uh, media, uh, there is no special privilege that <coughs> protects a news <coughs> gathering person from being required to disclose the, uh, the source of their news. As you know, several people recently have been uh, jailed for refusing to disclose that. And so the federal, so the federal rules do not have an, a provision protecting uh, news gatherers from being required to disclose their sources. However, California is different in that regard right here California at section 1070 does have a provision which says that a person cannot be held in contempt of court, a news gatherer uh, cannot be held in contempt of court for refusing to disclose the source of their news. Now this doesn't mean that you can't find other ways to coerce these people into disclosing their sources, but so far as we're concerned, the evidence rules do provide that the court cannot find them in contempt for refusing to do that. Still uh, following up on privileges, and privileges are again a part of our public policy, uh, the privileges in uh, the attorney-client privilege, the 
FRE provide, under the FRE, the uh, privileges, the attorney-client privilege continues even after the person is dead. And the, the notes of the attorney and statements which the person made in the attorney-client privilege setting, even for criminal cases, there have been cases where the, the U.S. attorney wanted to recover what the person said to their lawyer after the person was dead, and the privilege continues to apply. Whereas in California, the rule is a little bit different. In California, the privilege ends when the estate of the deceased person is closed. Next, under these public policy exclusions, payment of medical bills, essentially the same under both systems. Sex crimes, the sex crimes are pretty much the same under both systems, but the reason I haven't spent a lot of time here is because the history of the bar really suggests that they're not going to test the rules of evidence very often in the area of sex crimes. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the reason for that is. It's never been done. They don't test in this area on the essay part. And I'm hoping that the reason that they don't do it is because of the good judgment that there are so many women who have been the victims of sex crimes that if a woman is trying to take the bar exam and suddenly she's confronted with a fact situation which is similar to some way in which she might have been victimized, or even if she knows somebody who has been victimized in that way, it's unfair to her because how is she going to think clearly and objectively when under those circumstances? And so it would be very unfair. And I presume and hope that that's the reason that the bar examiners have not tested in this area in the law of evidence. They also used to have um, in the essay question uh, once in a while a crime involving rape, and they've stopped doing that. And I hope that it's because of that same good judgment. And that's why the, the two systems aren't very different, but that's why I'm not spending any time on these. If you want to look at them, please do. Uh, in the California rules, they run from 412 to about 415, and there's a comparable, uh, pardon me, in the FRE, it's 412 to 415, and there's a comparable California set that really say pretty much the same thing. Insurance cases. As you know, on the FRE 411, you cannot uh, disclose insurance uh, for the purpose of establishing negligence. And unless you have some other basis, some other reason for disclosing that someone is insured, then it's not acceptable for you to even sort of mention uh, in passing that the person has insurance, because the presumption is that the jury will make unfair use of this. And so you can't disclose the insurance unless you've got some other reason for doing it other than proving negligence. Uh, for example, if you're using an insurance policy to show ownership of some property, that might do something of that sort. Um, California follows that same policy. However, California does allow, interestingly enough, uh, by the case law, a person to uh, claim that since I had no insurance, I was driving more carefully than usual because I knew I didn't have any insurance. So you can use the absence of insurance as evidence of due care in California. That's kind of an oddity. Competence. A person needs to be competent in order to testify. The federal rules at 601 say a person needs to be competent. The California rules really are pretty much the same. But the, uh, there is a specific California rule regarding hypnosis. There is no specific federal rules. The California rules, it says if someone is going to testify after being hypnotized regarding some matter, that their testimony needs to have been pre-recorded before the hypnosis. Otherwise, what they have to say about the matter after being hypnos hypnotized regarding that matter is not admissible. The uh, Confrontation Clause, uh, this is really a constitutional matter. 
that one has a right to confront their witnesses against them under the Sixth Amendment. And of course, that's going to be the same whether it's California state courts or the federal rules of evidence. So this is pretty much the places where, these are the places where there are uh, differences in the uh, uh, exclusions based on public policy, differences between the federal rules of evidence and the California rules. So we next then turn, since we're here at public policy considerations, we next go to reliability of out-of-court statements. And that's basically hearsay. So let's take a look at our hearsay rules. Uh, and the differences are shown here. And let's talk about these one at a time. First of all, prior identifications. Prior identifications are treated pretty much the same under the federal rules and under the California rules. And that is, if a witness has made a prior identification of someone, and now at trial they can't remember, uh, they cannot identify them at trial, if they are there and available for cross-examination, then they, uh, the prior identification, which is an out-of-court statement, is admissible to identify the person. And the two systems are essentially the same regarding that. The excited utterance, essentially no real difference. The names are different. California calls them spontaneous uh, declaration, but the rules aren't significantly different. Number three, present sense impression. Now you recall the present sense impression occurs in the case where a person is, uh, uh, where I'm, some event is taking place. It doesn't have to be an exciting event now. And while that event is taking place, or shortly after the event has taken place, if I declare something that tends to explain or describe the event, then that's admissible under the present sense impression exception to the hearsay rule under the federal rules. Uh, so if I see a car going down the street and the person kind of is weaving from lane to lane and I feel like this person is probably a drunk driver and I say to you, either while I'm watching the car go down the street or shortly thereafter, I say to you, that driver must be drunk. Okay? That's a declaration of my present sense impression. Uh, if a police officer is measuring a skid mark and yells to another police officer, 75 feet, and the second police officer writes it down as 75 feet in the police report. Well, the person who read the ruler and said 75 cent feet, that's a present, a present sense impression at the time he was doing that. Now, so we have over here that these present sense impressions, may, uh, it's at 803.1 under the federal rules, California has a much more limited version of, of it. California says the present sense impression is admissible only to explain some present act. In other words, I need to, be, if I'm the witness, I need to, part, uh, I don't have to be the witness, but let's say I am doing something. I'm sawing a piece of wood. I'm hammering a nail. I'm doing something, driving a car. And I make a statement about the very act that I am engaged in and saying that act to you, I might explain to you why I'm doing it or something of that sort. Then the present sense impression works. But outside of explaining an act that I am presently right now actually personally engaged in, there is no present sense impression rule in California. But there is under the federal rules. Item four. Item four, the declaration against interest. Uh, the California section 1230, you can declare against your social interest. Normally, you know, when people make a declaration against interest, it needs to be a declaration against their, their pecuniary or money or property interest. Pecuniary meaning money <coughs> or property interest, uh, but uh, and also punitive uh, interest is allowed, but in California we've expanded that a bit further and we say 
A person does not want to be held up to ridicule, scorn, contempt in that way. And if uh, I make a statement uh, that, uh, that uh, is against my social interest, I say something that is going to hold me up to ridicule, scorn, contempt, hatred, that I wouldn't normally say that unless there was some truth in it. And so we have this uh, exception in California. The Declaration Against Interest includes strong social interest, whereas it, that is not included under the federal rules of Declaration Against Interest. Number five, confessions which exculpate another person. One person is confessing, saying, I did it, Joe did not do it. That's a confession which exculpates another person. In those situations under the federal rules, that confession needs to be corroborated, whereas California does not require any corroboration for that sort of thing. Next, item six here, forfeiture by wrongdoing. I just have the word wrongs here on the board. It's actually wrongdoing, wrongful conduct. And what we're talking about are those cases where someone has procured the absence of a witness on purpose. And in California, uh, pardon me, under the federal rules, if you've procured the absence of a witness, then the, the then hearsay is admissible. Under California rules at 1350, the, the, the rule is really uh, much more stringent than that. California says that if you have uh, 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 procured the... Uh, it says 1350. California says that in cases where you're saying the person has procured the unavailability of a witness, there's a bunch of requirements that have to be met in order to get hearsay admissible in that case. First of all, uh, the evidence has to be proven. You have to prove the procurement by clear and convincing evidence. That's the first requirement, clear and convincing evidence. And you got to prove that the witness was either kidnapped or killed by clear and convincing evidence. Um, the, uh, you need, uh, in that case, you still need a tape recording of what the witness had to say. And that tape recording has to be made to a police officer or some law enforcement official. And in addition to it being made, to a law enforcement official, it needs to be notarized. Okay. And finally, you have to give the other side notice that you intend to bring in that statement. So it takes all of that to get a hearsay statement in at a criminal trial based on 1350. And that's item six. Item seven, the learned treaties exception. Uh, the Learned Treaties exception and under the federal rules is at FRE 803.18. But under FRE 803.18, uh, once you have established that a uh, source, some learned treaties, Gray's Anatomy or something, is a learned treatise, that you can read what the learned treaties has to say to the jury. The, the book itself is not admissible but you can read, read from it, and that is admissible. In California, we have a somewhat similar learned treaties exception, but it only applies to facts which are uh, sort of notorious facts. They don't apply to uh, the strange, odd kinds of things that you would get in a, uh, 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 you know, in a technical journal. Uh, matters of general notoriety maps, history books, things of that sort. The term here is matters of general notoriety uh, can be read to the jury from a learned treatise, whereas under the federal rules, any technical matter, not necessarily of general notoriety, can be read to the jury. Next comes the dying declaration. Under the federal rules, the person does not have to be dead at the trial. They simply had to think they were dying at the time they made the statement. Under the California rules for dying declarations, person must be deceased, dead, 
at the time of trial. Next comes this item here, prior statements of a deceased person. Now, these prior statements of a deceased person, we don't really have a, uh, a federal counterpart to that, but California has a rule uh, regarding prior statements of a deceased person that it applies, first of all, only at criminal trials. The person, this deceased person, must have made a statement under oath. Uh, the person must have died of unnatural causes. Well, we have to hear these cases where people kill witnesses to keep, the, keep them from uh, testifying against them. And so here at these criminal cases where this has happened, the rule is that uh, the person, while they're alive, can make the statement, it has to be under oath, it uh, must be, uh, uh, it must be, the person must have died of unnatural causes, and the statement must be generally trustworthy. Nothing, nothing about it that indicates it's not trustworthy. And that's a California rule exclusively. Item 10 comes admissions, and you and I know that uh, the FRE defines admissions at 801 in such a way that admissions are not even hearsay. Under California, uh, California follows the common law. I don't know, this writing here is a little confusing. Under California, we, uh, their uh, admissions are treated as hearsay, but there is an exception to the hearsay rule. That exception happens to be section 1220. It's not on the board here. I'll put it up now. I believe that's it, section 1220. So it's a hearsay exception in California. Uh, item 11, the catch-all. Uh, California has a catch-all exception to hearsay. Pardon me, the federal rules. The federal rules have a catch-all exception to hearsay. Uh, California does not have a catch-all exception. California does allow judges to make judicial exceptions to hearsay. Um, Certainly at the uh, appellate level they can do it, which means they could probably do it at the trial level. Uh, so judges can probably do it because the statute says they can make judicial decisions. But there is no catch-all as such in California. There is under the federal rules. Item 12 at California section 1226, we have another uh, section which is unique to California, not present in the federal rules at all. And this section says that if you, if a child makes a statement to someone, uh, if the child is suing for a personal injury to the child, and the child makes a statement about their injury, uh, or how they got it or something of that sort, that, 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 that is hearsay, of course, but it is admissible in a case where the child is the plaintiff suing for the personal injury. So the hearsay statements of a child uh, are, can be admitted in those cases. Next, uh, at 1203.1, uh, California has a special rule at preliminary hearings. The idea here at 1203.1 is that sometimes people uh, are, have come to California and have become victims of some kind of a crime in California. And then they go back to New York, and the DA wants to prosecute. But uh, in principle, they'd have to bring the person out here for the preliminary hearing to get past, to show probable cause. Then the person go back to New York. And then when the trial comes up, they got to bring him out here again for the trial. And so in order to eliminate some of that, there's a special rule at preliminary hearings that will allow a police officer to testify to what the person would have said. Now, in order for this to work at 1203.1, at a preliminary hearing, the police officer needs to have five years experience on the force or be certified to handle this kind of a case, and, um, the, uh, and then they can do it. 
Finally, under item 14, there's a special rule for elder uh, and dependent adults. Elder and dependent adults who might not be able to get to trial, and we allow them to testify, a special hearsay exception for them. This requires that the statement be made to law enforcement officers, that police or someone like that, that it be a trustworthy statement, that the person making it is the victim of a crime, and it requires some corroboration and 10 days notice. All that stuff for this elder dependent adult exception to hearsay. So those are all the places where there are some significant differences between the California Evidence uh, Code and the Federal Rules of Evidence. And that brings us now down through here, reliability of out-of-court statements, and that takes us to item five, reliability of documents. Well, uh, for that, we um, here, The reliability of documents under the federal rules, ancient documents found in the place where you expect them to be found with no indications of lack of trustworthiness and the people uh, 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 that in in, under the federal rules, if the document is 20 years old, that's sufficient. California requires 30 years. Uh, that's as to documents. Now, as to objects like ball tires and things of that sort, you authenticate those objects in the same way uh, under both code systems. Finally, comes the substitutes for evidence. Uh, scientific opinions, uh, these are under California. We are still following the Fry rule. Federal rules of evidence follow Dobert. Under Fry, the uh, scientific testimony, the expert opinion regarding scientific conclusions uh, must be <coughs> those which have been generally accepted by the scientific community that this comes from. Whereas under the federal rules, um, Dolbert doesn't require that it's been generally accepted, but just simply that it is a respectable scientific position. Uh, conduct, you know, that they're is a scientific community that follows that, but doesn't have to be generally accepted. Judicial notice is another kind of substitute for evidence. Under ju judicial notice at 201G, at FRE 201G, FRE 201G says that if a judge takes judicial notice of some fact that at a civil trial, the jury is conclusively bound by that. They cannot decide any other way. In California, that applies at, at civil trials, but at criminal trials under the FRE, the rule is that the jury is not bound by the courts taking judicial notice of some fact. They may agree with the judge, but they don't have to. In California, the difference is that the a jury is bound by matters which have been judicially noticed, whether it's a civil trial or a criminal trial, in both cases in California. Next comes presumptions. Now, as you know, there are basically two types of presumptions, and uh, there are presumptions which you can make disappear by simply going forward with credible evidence to the contrary something contrary to the presumption. There is a presumption that a letter which was properly mailed uh, was received. Well, if the person simply comes forward and says, I didn't receive it, or presents any credible evidence contrary to the presumption, then the presumption totally disappears. And the only thing the jury hears is one side saying, I mailed it, and the other side saying, well, I didn't get it. And the jury can decide whatever they want to believe. So that's one way that presumptions are handled, where they can be made to disappear. And those are what's called presumptions affecting the burden of going forward with evidence, or the burden of producing evidence. And the reason it's got that label is because all you have to do to make the presumption disappear 
is to go forward with or produce evidence, credible evidence, contrary to the presumption, and it's gone. So that's one way presumptions are handled. Many states handle them that way. Many other states handle presumptions in a different way. They handle them so that a person, once a presumption has been created, because you've got all the foundations for it, that there's nothing on earth you can do to make the presumption go away. All you can do is to try to overcome the presumption with the preponderance of the evidence, so that if there's a presumption that a letter which was mailed was received, and if that presumption ever gets created, the person who says, I didn't get it, they cannot make the presumption go away. All they can do is to try to produce abun abundance of evidence, you know, uh, with preponderance of the evidence that they didn't get it. And the burden is on them to prove they didn't get it. So those are the two ways that presumptions are handled. Now, under the federal rules, presumptions are handled in the first way, where you can make them disappear by simply putting on credible evidence to the contrary. And these presumptions are said to be presumptions affecting the burden of producing evidence or burden of going forward with evidence. Uh, so that's how the federal rules handle it. Burden, you can make them disappear. California, on the other hand, has both types of presumptions. California says some presumptions you should be able to make disappear, others you should not. And California basically has a rule that says if the presumption is based on public policy, then you cannot make that presumption disappear. Presumption that people do not commit suicide is based on public policy, and uh, you can't make that one disappear. Whereas a presumption that people got the mail that was sent to them, well, you know, that's just based on probabilities. It's not based on any public policy. So the general concept in California is that presumptions based on probabilities, you can make them disappear by going forward with credible evidence to the contrary. Whereas presumptions which are based on public policy, there's nothing you can do to make those disappear. So that's the difference in the way presumptions are handled. And finally, facts which are necessary to a prior conviction. Uh, if, a, uh, <coughs> if a person has been convicted, a witness has been convicted of some crime and you want to impeach the witness, uh, the uh, facts, the, uh, uh, the, the fact of the conviction itself is considered evidence of the facts which were necessary to, for the conviction to occur. The facts which were necessary to the conviction uh, are presumed to have been established. That's a, a, a rule um, that, uh, um, the, uh, yeah, the, that's at, yeah, that's why I wanted to check that. Uh, this is at FRAE 803.22. California has a similar rule. This is one of the places where it's different. The California rule says that this evidence, uh, this, is admiss this is true only in civil cases. In a civil case, if a person has been convicted of some prior uh, crime, then the uh, 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 if the conviction itself is considered to be evidence of the facts which were necessary for this conviction. That works at civil trials in California. It works at civil and criminal trials under the federal rules. That takes care of item six here on the board, substitute for evidence. And item seven on the board was a question of who can testify. And we dealt with that item already. Now, the one thing I want to come back to, and then this will be the end of our session on this matter, and the matter that I uh, wanted to come back to is... Uh,
right here. Uh, prior convictions to impeach, and I want to be absolutely sure about this, and so if you'll take about a two-minute break, I will check my source to be sure we've got that just right. Yes, uh -huh. thank you for the um, a moment of delay, but I've checked my source to be sure that for prior convictions used to impeach, that the federal rule and the California rule are essentially the same. I drew them differently on the board because my source had discussed them, but when I read the discussion again,
they really amount to the same thing. So there's no difference between, in other words, FRE 609, which is uh, one that's used here for prior convictions. FRE 609 is essentially is the same both places. So there's no real difference between FRE 609 and the California counterpart. And that takes care of this part. Okay. Uh, the, uh, uh, as you can see, there are not a lot of places where the differences in the California evidence uh, code and the federal rules of evidence, for the most part, they're awfully, they're very much alike. And partly because of that, I would expect that the, the California bar examiners will test the California evidence code in a traditional evidence problem where they'll ask you to answer both ways. Whereas something like, uh, they'll ask you to answer under the California rules and under the federal rules of evidence. Or ask you about a particular point in the question, ask you on that particular point to answer under both set of rules. Whereas something like partnerships, for example, I think uh, will be tested on its own probably as a separate question, and we'll deal with that in a different lecture. That's the end of this lecture.